now. Please join me in welcoming Shop Talk's opening keynote, Robert Gentz, co founder and co CEO of Zalando. Robert will be interviewed by Kirsty McGregor, executive European editor at Vogue Business. everyone, yes, look at you, there's so many of you with cameras up, it's amazing. Um, welcome to this session, to the opening keynote. I'm very pleased to be here interviewing Robert because I remember around 10 years ago when I was reporting on the UK fashion retail industry that we started to write about this German e-tailer called Zalando who seemed to just sort of burst onto the scene. I think you'd been in the market maybe a couple of years at that point. It's not that long to establish yourself. And then suddenly, every brand seemed to be, you, you were just announcing partnership after partnership after partnership. That was about a decade ago. Now you have 51 million customers, active across 25 markets in Europe. I mean, you've come quite a way in that time. So this session is looking at the kind of foundations you've laid for growth. But what I would like to do is start at the beginning with your, if you can just paint your, your kind of original vision for Zalando, did you ever think it was going to get to where it has now? Yeah, um, yeah, exa so, exa so when, we, when we started Zalando, about, uh, like my co-founder and myself, like 14 years ago, um, you know, it was not really based like, on, a, on a big vision, eh? on a big idea. It was you know, based on the insight that we can actually do a very decent job in selling shoes online. Yeah? So it was not the most innovative idea. There were thousands of companies already doing it. Um, but I think we had a, we had a pre pretty clear view that we can do some stuff actually better. Yeah? So, and, and I think by really um, you know, doing everything ourselves in, this, in the start, customer care on our cell phones, like delivering packages, um, you know, personally to the post office and doing online marketing campaigns, I think there was actually a lot of um, you know, insights that we created of how to actually do it uh, better huh, in a way. Huh? And, um, I think that was really, I think, the, uh, the, the start of what we didn't do. And then so you were giving out, what, your personal mobile number to people? No, I think we had, we had, we had uh, like, you know, the, the, uh, like, the customer care number, it went actually on, on our cell phones, and we just, you know, were listening to how customers experienced yeah. it. And, and I think in, in by doing so, we, what we actually could do is we just had a very fresh pair of eyes, I think, on every single process of how, uh, how online could work. And, uh, and yeah, and when we actually figured out, then we just scaled, I think, this process very, very nice, very nicely. And in the end, we, you know, went from zero to more than a billion sales in just four years, which was actually the first company in Europe who has ever done that. Yeah? And I guess, for me, one of the core insights, I think, from, from these days was, um, I think, first of all, you know, it's not only about the idea, it's actually mostly about the execution. And I think the second insight that was very important for us is, is I think you really can only do great stuff if you don't only rely on, uh, on, you know, on the best practices, but really think of these best practices with a fresh pair of eyes. How would you actually do it today? And I think these principles, they still carry us uh, until to this day. And you mentioned that you know, there were other people out there who were selling shoes online, but I imagine quite a few of those were coming at it from the point of view of being more of a traditional bricks and mortar retailer who then was adding in an online element. So. From your point of view, I presume that coming at it as a sort of digital pure play helped you to be that yeah. bit more agile. Yeah, I think and it helped to be more agile, and I think it comes down to this fresh pair of eyes. I think, yeah. So, for example, if you if you think about returns, yeah, if you come from it from a very um, traditional way, I think the managing returns is a, is a it's just a cost line. Yeah, so it's a painful process. Yeah? And we understood that it's a painful process, but it's as well something that actually can drive CLV. Yeah? So if you actually, like, like nobody really loves returns, yeah? but if you, if you enable like returns um, for customers and actually enable them that have the, the, the like the, that they don't hesitate like to order something because they know it's actually easy to return, it really drives CLV. Yeah? And that was one example of, I think, um, a different view on, on, on a proposition, on a process that actually helped us to have a much more long-term view about customer acquisition and, 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 and driving convenience and driving um, yeah, customer lifetime value on our platform. And I think these views, they were not, at the time, I think they were not um, so used, for example, when you actually just run an online store for a bricks and mortar um, 
shoe shop. And you started, obviously, you launched in Germany. You then quickly started to expand to other markets. There must have been a few learnings along the way. What, looking back, like what did you get wrong that kind of helped you to, to learn how to do things better? Yeah, I think plenty of them. So I, I, um, I, I think I remember like the, the first country we launched after Germany was actually Netherlands. And we had, um, we had in Germany, we had this amazing kind of TV spot at the time that really worked well, which was uh, that had, had, had a scream in there, like had a, had, a, had, a guy, had a guy that was just sitting in the cupboard and says, like, you know, don't ever let your partner discover Zalando uh, because it ruined my life. And then, like, you know, and, and, and then a postman knocking on the door and, like, there was a scream of joy. So it was very emotional. It was very funny at the time. The humor was different. So it was very funny at the time in Germany. And then when we went to launch to, to Netherlands, I think the Dutch team, they told me, no way, um, this, this will go very, very bad in, in, in Netherlands. And I said, well, come on, Germans, Dutch, uh, we're not so different. And, like, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious it's the most successful TV spot that has been aired, like, in Germany for, for a long time. We had it, we had it in, uh, in, in, in Netherlands, and it, was the, it won the prize for the worst TV spot. Yeah? Um, and, uh, and I think our brand metrics had tanked. It was like, you know, it was a very not sympathetic brand. And um, yeah, and I just learned, okay, well, this is definitely something. So people are just very different. So driving localization is one of a, a very underestimated um, yeah, problem. So um, I'd like to go on to talk about the platform strategy. Can you tell, me, tell us a bit about it and what, like how that is driving growth for Zalando? Yeah. Um, I think you know the core difference for me between like retail and, and platform is more the, the 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 idea behind it. Yeah. So I think as a retailer you want to control everything. As a platform you want to enable. Yeah. Uh, you want to enable. You create win-win situations for customers, for brands, and and, and for yourself. And um, we started off as a retailer, so we were very keen on just controlling stuff because we at our own pace we could scale, we could control the operations, um, um, we could uh, control our like our risk budget. So we started out in this way, but we realized in order to really, um, you know, be relevant and, and drive growth in the long term, you have to align yourselves uh, with the interests of brands. Huh? So you have to create much more enablements for brands that they can drive their business. They get the real insights and, 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 and can drive a business on Zalando. So that's why we then actually open up the platform, open up the retail as a platform and uh, basically enable brands to um, to drive their own direct-to-consumer business on Zalando, so they get the access to 51 million customers across Europe. They can use our logistics, uh, to, uh, our logistics networks um, to, to fill these orders, or they can um, integrate their own fulfillment centers or their, 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 their connect retail, um, their retail stores. So it is very much around driving, um, uh, driving enablement for brands um, and aligning them uh, on experiences that we can jointly drive for our customers, for our 51 million customers across Europe. So then how has your relationship with those brands changed over the years? Yeah, I think as a, as a retailer, you, you, like back in the days, I think it was mostly on commercials and terms and, 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 um, and uh, yeah, and more, like more commercially short-term minded. Mm -hmm. I think especially over the last couple of years, the, the consumers have become much more challenging. Yes, yeah, much more... Um, um, there's many strategic topics, I think, that brands as well work with, such as how to drive uh, sustainability, how to drive circularity, um, how to keep up with the always increasing demands of consumers. Yeah. And I think, therefore, I think our relationship has become much more strategic and much more in partnership. And we just yeah, partner up to, to, to jointly create like, the future of fashion. I'd love to talk about some of the tech innovations that you've definitely led the way in in the market. Um, Last month, was it, that you, uh, you announced that you were going to launch the, the beta ver version of the fashion assistant powered by chat GPT? Um, why invest in generative AI? It's the, it's the buzzword at the moment. But why for Zalando was that an important thing to do? Well, I think, um, I think the fashion e-commerce is, um, I think what is, what is very clear for us is that fashion e-commerce, how it's done now, won't be done in the same way in 15 years. Eh? So we just don't know how it will be done. But I'm, I'm very sure that in 15 years, when we look back at these times, that um, we will just scratch our heads and say, OK, why have you done that uh, still in this way? So I think there is an, there's a dedication of us, uh, of, of us as a company to always embrace uh, like new technologies and, and see 
how they actually can help us to create like new experiences. Yeah? And I think one of the one of the core um, um, core problems out there, I think, in, in fashion e-commerce, it is not yet really fun. No? So fashion e-commerce is very efficient, it's very easy, um, but it's not it's not yet 100% fun. It's not yet always clearer that fashion e-commerce is much more inspirational and fun as it's to actually go into a physical store. Mm. Um, and I think um, this is actually something that we actually have to have to have to drive to become better at it. Yeah? And I think there's many um, innovations now um, at a very fast pace that are happening that we want to embrace. So it's, uh, it's, there's, um, there's a lot happening on the content side. Yeah? So we actually see that, for example, uh, 3D images, yeah? they, 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 they help us to generate more, more engagement with customers, consumers. We're very convinced that um, a major way of how consumers will interact with us in the future is uh, through, um, uh, through short videos. Yeah? Okay. So on the content side, there's, I think, a lot of things happening that actually will help to, um, to drive engagement and will make it much more fun. And um, I think the advancements you see on generative AI, on, on machine learning, computer vision, I think all these advancements um, will actually help, help um, digital players to make the experience much more relevant, much more personal, and ultimately as well um, help us to reduce waste. Yeah? Do you sense, is there still some wariness amongst consumers around generative AI though? Because I think we've all had our, our own personal experiences with chatbots that haven't worked very well and it's been quite clunky in the past. That tech has really moved on a lot, hasn't it? But do you, do you feel like in the, in the market that some consumers might still need a little bit of educating or convincing? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, is far from, um, it is far from helping you at scale to um, to find always a better choice, yeah? but I think what is what generative AI I think is now um, enabling probably to do is understand context out there um, and uh, understand like you know products, yeah? putting products into the context and help you to drill it down from a context to a, to a product, which I think um, non-generative AI solutions cannot yet do. I think you know you search something and it appears, but I think like having a conversation and having a conversation a multi-layer conversation to drill it down from a context towards a product is, I think, what generative AI um, is, is, is able to do. And it's largely going to be that kind of product discovery side of it, do you think? Or do you see it having wider applications going forward? Well, I think, I think in, in fashion, um, or fashion and lifestyle, I think it solves one, one use case, I think, which as well see like in physical stores that like, you know, you see a lot of people go into a physical store and just scroll around and just, uh, you know, get inspired. So they, they don't need any interaction, any social, they don't need an device. Huh? But there's actually some use cases where you actually really have an event coming up, yeah? so shop talk mm -hmm. and um, what should I wear, like it's Barcelona. And, um, and I think like on, on, on those kind of like occasions, I think there is actually some, some, some advice needs sometimes. Huh? So you ask a friend, you ask, uh, um, you ask an assistant. And I think those kind of use cases, which is not 100% in fashion, but those kind of use cases, I think actually um, um, chatbots are, will be able to solve, probably not yet this year, but I think in the future it will be able so, to solve these, these use cases at scale with a lot of context and better than you want. Now you mentioned the importance of content. I'd love to find out more about your acquisition of High Snobiety because that was a really interesting move. Obviously, you know, they're kind of in the media space. So um, at the time you said part of the, the reasoning was to kind of learn from each other around that kind of storytelling approach. Um, talk us through where, where did this come from, this idea to, to partner with High Snobiety? Yeah, I think um, it is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great success for us um, because we are really coming, like Zalando and High Snobiety are coming from different perspectives. Yeah? Zalando comes from the perspective of solving big problems at scale for 50 million customers and I think High Snobiety comes more from um, being very relevant to a, to a small group, but being highly relevant and coming from a storytelling perspective. And, um, and likewise, Zalando, we, we speak uh, more to like, the, the e-commerce departments and, and, and the sales departments of brands, and uh, High Snobiety speaks more to the marketing departments of brands. And I think together we can actually create holistic experiences for brands, and we can ho create holistic experiences well for, for consumers. And I think it's one of the, those, those key challenges that we are trying to join uh, to jointly solve is how to actually make fashion more inspirational, how to actually tell better stories in fashion, how to um, how to engage consumers on the on in, in, in relevancy at scale. 
And I think that's uh, ultimately what we're um, what we're doing together. And um, yeah, I think it's more of the holy grails we're we are in, in fashion we are we are chasing um, together. So what could we expect like going forwards coming out of that acquisition? Are you you well, know do you see yourself developing projects? that you will then implement going forwards? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's, a major, there's a major launch we will do this year um, that has much more content elements into it mm -hmm. um, and um, makes fashion discovery much more, much, much more interesting, much more content-driven. Um, and there is, um, yeah, and, uh, and we're working, for example, as well on product uh, drops. Huh? So there's already 80 product drops that we actually joined, where we partner with brands to tell a story around the specific products uh, they wanted to, uh, to launch on Zalando and tell a story to consumers in an exciting way and Make, make everyone excited about it. So I think this is really interesting. This is something that we've seen come through so much during the pandemic years and, and you know, now that things are settling down post-pandemic, where the connection, that emotional connection with consumers is all important. And it sounds like House and Mighty is helping you to kind of develop a, a more sophisticated way of connecting consumers. How else are you doing that during this kind of period of, of economic downturn? Yeah. I. I think, um, well, I think, like, first of all, I think these, these times, I think they are, um, you know, maybe like uh, comparing it to surfing. Yeah? I think in, uh, when, there's, when there's no waves, I think it's very hard to, to surf. Yeah? But I think you can actually use these times very well to just prepare, like, you know, to position yourself when the actually next, next wave of surf actually comes. And I think in these times, I think you can, like, we as an organization, we really focus, I think, as well on the, on the inputs, on the things that we can control. Because consumer sentiment is, 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 is hard to, to control, or hard, to, hard to drive. Yeah. But I think that being said, I think in, a, in these opportunities, in these times, there's always opportunities in. Yeah? And we, um, for example, see that now in, the, in our shopping club yeah, business, so which, is, uh, which is, I think, now a great time because there, there is, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, leftover inventory from last year, so you can build actually great offers um, for consumers. So tell, tell everyone about the shopping clubs. So this is launched by Zalando. Yeah, that's launched by Zalando. So it's so a the, shopping club. It's, it's a, like, like event-based shopping. Yeah? So every single morning at 7 a.m. there's a new shopping, uh, there's a new event uh, coming up from just exciting merchandise uh, off-season, but like it's, it's at, at very attractive prices. Yeah? And you see, I think this, this, um, this proposition creating a lot of growth now in the stage. So it actually grew year on year in Q1, like more than 30%. Um, and it creates a lot of engagement with consumers yeah? because you, you just have these leftovers and you have to, mar you have to market, you can market them very well and, um, and consumers, you know, very price sensitive at the moment and it just really, really, um, uh, really well engaging with these campaigns. So I think that being said, there's always opportunities in these, in these times and I think that's just what we see as a, as a business. There's some element, elements that are very nicely growing and some others that are harder in these times, but uh, it's our job to focus on the ones that we can control. So can I ask which ones are a bit harder in these times? Well, I think what you, what you generally see is, the, um, there is um, I think there is, let's say, I think there's some brands that are more in the, in the upper price range. I think they are, I think, benefiting. Um, mm. um, and there's, I think, some brands that are more in the lower price range. They're benefiting. I think the middle is the one. Right, and that's normal there. in these kind of economic conditions, isn't it? You get people kind of drifting one to the other. But it, uh, in your Q1 results, I saw that there was mention of the online shopping club and particularly of the off-price offer. Um, also, there was, and this kind of goes back to the content, and you mentioned about drops. Um, so tell us about your strategy when it comes to doing product drops and exclusive collaborations, because that's another way, of course, to build um, a kind of more of a community, isn't it? And, and particularly tap into that fashion community. So what have you found successful there? Yeah, I think, um, mm, I think you know, there is a lot of noise um, always out there for consumers. And I think the big question for every single brand is, how can you um, cut through this noise and actually make build excitement for consumers. Huh? And um, I think this is one of the core, core challenges I think that many brands have. How do, how do I design um, like an exclusive story around the products I create that really cut through the noise, huh? cut through the noise and actually get, get the attention of consumers. And I think there's a lot of around the storytelling elements, there's a lot of like building up excitement and as well there's a lot of like cutting, um, you know, cutting, um, cutting towards exclusivities and cutting towards, um, yeah, um, towards, um, um, yeah, towards, you know, not, not going for the, for the quantity, but rather go for the quality 
of these uh, of these items. So I think that's that's ultimately the journey that we are creating with our partners. Yeah, a lot of it is about that engagement, that creating the excitement around the discovery, around time limited, or you know the shopping club where it's the sort of limited availability of those discounts. It's all about kind of that. Uh, impulse to, to buy, isn't it? Um, we're running very quickly, running out of time. But I wanted to also talk about the fact that in your Q1 results, you know, the, um, you, you've made some real progress in that path to profitability. And I think really interesting to learn from you how you've managed to uh, drive efficiencies, um, but at the same time continue to invest in in the different innovations that you are investing in. Yeah, I think um, at at these times, I think what is for us always important is you have to do both and essentially you have to really run like a very tight ship and you have to um, manage the operations at scale and manage efficient but you have as well to think about like you know coming back to the surf surfboard example of how do you position your surfboard in the best way because you know like you know fashion online fashion i think in europe is in a 20 percentage area it will go up to 40 percent plus as it's in china or in the us um so so really as well embracing um, innovation, embracing technology um, innovations, and yeah, and and, and 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 innovating with it. And I think we talked a lot about these examples of ChatGPT, our work on on size and fit, uh, our work on um, on on content inspiration. And I think all these things they will actually help when the tide comes back and the wave comes back. They will come back. Yeah. So online is uh, is, is is structurally, I think, much better equipped to to. Um, to inspire customers and drive experiences than, um, than in a non-connected digital world. And just quickly to finish on, um, in terms of growth going forwards as well, are there still some gaps that you can identify in terms of what you're offering to brands that you can fill going forward? Where are the opportunities there? Or is, is growth going to come from category expansion? Is it ge geographical expansion? Or is it you know, more about offering something in the back end for you know, building out that platform service? Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the core areas that we that we hear from brands is um, is building digital and building Europe is like a very incredible um, challenge. Yeah? It's it's very complex, and it gets even more complex every single day. Yeah? With consumers uh, changing, new channels coming up, the pace actually going uh, going quite quite uh, the pace of innovation picking up quite a lot. So our commitment as an um, as a company is trying to make it as easy as possible for brands, and that's um, that's why we started to open up our infrastructure as well outside of Solano. So we, um, so we enable brands to, you know, to, to use the inventory within Zalando, um, uh, within our system, to as well serve other channels, uh, eventually as well serve their own direct-to-consumer business. So this is Zalando. brands that are selling on other platforms or their, essentially brands, their own e-commerce? Their own e-commerce, other platforms. Yeah. So essentially the idea is to, um, to deliver to the brands Europe in a box, Europe out of a box in one infrastructure. Um, and yeah, and really providing them with uh, with the with the back end that they can actually have Europe in a box, yeah? have Europe easy, um, with uh, with only one inventory pool. And I think this will drive a lot of um, a lot of simplicity, I think, for brands. Great. Um, I think we've well and truly run out of time, so I'm going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. 